Bismuth oxychloride is a lustrous white solid that has been most notably used in Egypt since around 3000 BC for various purposes. Currently, bismuth oxychloride is used as a pigment to give makeups either a matte or shimmery appearance. Although it is a relatively useless substance, I had some bismuth metal that has been sitting around in my lab for about a year, and I wanted to finally do something with it. I decided that making bismuth oxychloride would be a relatively painless process, but later on I was soon met with issues that made it honestly kind of a pain to do. Bismuth metal can react with chlorine ions in an atmosphere of oxygen to make bismuth chloride. This bismuth chloride can then react with water to form bismuth oxychloride and hydrochloric acid. This reaction is an equilibrium reaction, meaning that the products can react with each other to form the reactants. Because of this, we have to utilize Le Chatelier's law to favor the products of this equilibrium reaction, in this case the hydrochloric acid and bismuth oxychloride. To start off, I found a metal pan and decided to say my final goodbyes to it. After that, I hammered some bismuth metal to try to make it into some smaller chunks. The reaction is incredibly slow, so I was trying to increase the surface area to speed it up. Unfortunately, the bismuth metal was a lot harder than I had anticipated for, and so I decided to just go with a few of the smallest chunks that I had made. Fortunately, it resulted in some good unplanned commentary. Okay, that didn't really work that well. I transferred about 50 grams of bismuth metal into a 250 milliliter beaker by first pouring the metal into a metal crucible, and then pouring it into the beaker. I did this purely because I didn't really want to spill my crushed metal onto the concrete floor. I then constructed an O2 generation apparatus, in which I was going to utilize the reaction between hydrogen peroxide and sodium hypochlorite to produce oxygen gas and other soluble products. I did this by charging a 1000ml round bottom flask with a random amount of concentrated bleach. Then, I added a 500ml pressure equalizing addition funnel on top of the round bottom flask. I added about 200ml of 3% hydrogen peroxide to it. Later on, I decided to add about 200ml more. After I added the peroxide, I stoppered and used a cat clip to keep it in place. Then, for the necessary jerry rig portion of the setup, I added a still receiver with a stopper in the part where the condenser would normally go. This was going to be how I transport the oxygen gas out of the system. This was kind of a dirty setup, but I didn't really have a gas takeoff adapter currently, so this was the best I could come up with. I then attached a super stiff acrylic tube to the still receiver and added a glass pipe up to the end. I wasn't entirely sure if the tube would react with the acid in a negative way, and I didn't really want to go look it up, and I didn't want to risk finding out. So, I decided this was 100% the way to go. After that, I decided that the 250ml beaker was way too small, and I started prepping a 400ml beaker with a random amount of distilled water and a random amount of hydrochloric acid. The acid I used was tainted slightly yellow from iron from the manufacturing process. The solution I was using was about 0.1 molar, so A, the bismuth was absolutely in excess, and B, the entire reaction was going to be painfully slow. Then, with an incredible amount of difficulty, I inserted the pipette tip gas outlet thing into the reaction beaker. I decided to plop in a stir bar to the oxygen generator at this time, and I turned it on to relatively slow to stirring. To test it out, I slowly opened the stopcock to let hydrogen peroxide drip into the bleach. The reaction that takes place here is a simple redox reaction in which the hydrogen peroxide is oxidized to water and oxygen gas, which then bubbles out of solution. I then dumped in the bismuth metal and let it sit for a while. Honestly, I was expecting a slightly vigorous reaction, but I was soon disappointed when nothing really happened. After a few minutes of nothing happening, I added a lot more distilled water and a few drops of bromothymol blue indicator. The solution turned much more yellow, indicating a pH of about 2 or less. At some point later on, the bromothymol blue indicator seemed to have magically vanished, and I was getting kind of frustrated with the floppy glass tube. I decided to clamp the pipette into place, and I added about way too much more of the indicator. I also decided to add a lot more water, so I transferred everything into a 1 liter beaker and added about 200 milliliters of distilled water, which I had transferred over from my 3 gallon jug to a now empty hydrogen peroxide container for easier pouring. Once again, the hydrolysis of bismuth chloride to bismuth oxychloride is an equilibrium reaction, so we must favor the product side to produce a reasonable amount of bismuth oxychloride. In order to do this, we can either add an excess of reactants or remove products as soon as they are formed. Unfortunately, this process is so slow that removing products isn't really a good idea. Fortunately though, one of the reactants is water, so all we have to do is add an extreme excess of this. I turned on somewhat strong stirring and I placed a paper towel on top to avoid splashing over. I left the setup going for the entire night. When I came back in the morning, I was met with an extremely runny slurry of white bismuth oxychloride with metal bismuth chunks sitting at the bottom. I decided that the next step would be to try to filter off the bismuth oxychloride and dry it. Unfortunately, I had too much mixture to filter it off in one go, so I had to do two vacuum filtrations. Up until now, everything was pretty much going as well as I thought it could have been. However, at this point, things started to slightly fall apart. As you can see, I somehow thought that while I had too much liquid for my 500ml filter funnel, I wouldn't have too much liquid for my 500ml Erlenmeyer flask. I don't know entirely what was going on through my head, but as you can see, it almost resulted in a huge mess. Somehow though, 
I managed to fix the error without spilling any of the mixture by simply pouring the filtrate into my original liter beaker. I then continued the filtration and immediately ran into another problem. Apparently, the particles of my product were actually small enough to pass through the membrane, so on top I was left with a bit of product clumped up, and the filtrate was an amalgamation of the product and the filtrate. I decided not to worry about it too much and pumped the vacuum for about a few more minutes in order to dry up the product. I used a glass stir rod to transport the semi-dry, paste-like product to a piece of printer paper on top of a paper towel. The reason for this is that the printer paper has a membrane small enough so that the particles won't absorb into it, but the water will be absorbed into the paper and then into the paper towels, allowing it to efficiently dry up. I then began the laborious process of trying to remove as much water as I could from the amalgamation so I could evaporate it. I started by letting it settle for about half an hour and decanting as much of the water as I could into my original liter beaker. I poured the leftover mixture through a basic gravity filter with two coffee filters into a 250 milliliter beaker. Clearly though, the coffee filters weren't good enough because as soon as I started to pour it, the amalgamation easily passed through it. Thankfully though, the coffee filters managed to separate at least some of it and I added them to the drying paper. I then poured the mixture back into an Erlenmeyer flask. After that, I was kinda stumped and I wasn't entirely sure how to decrease the volume of the mixture. I didn't really want to have to boil it off as I only have a heating mantle so that would be kind of difficult to get the solid product out of the round bottom flask. Thankfully though, I thought a simple solution would be to pour the remaining mixture into a long test tube and let it settle out and then decant it. I tried doing this, but the test tube was way too small and I had to use a second one. I then let it sit and decant as much as I could. I repeated this process until I had a relatively small amount of liquid I was honestly comfortable with waiting for it to evaporate. I transferred all the liquid to an evaporation tray and called it a day. I waited about 8 hours for the pastry filter residue to dry, and then I transferred both the printer paper portion and the coffee filter portion to another evaporation tray. Unfortunately, not to my surprise, the amalgamation was not even close to dry yet. I decided I wouldn't include that in my final product, and instead I'd just add it later. The next step was to remove all the unreacted bismuth metal, and I did so by first trying to mostly crush up and powderize the bismuth oxychloride. Then, I kind of shook around the tray to try to separate the large and small particles. This didn't really work that well, so I moved the mixture to one side of the tray and slowly tried to separate the bismuth metal chunks. Originally, I was very diligent in trying to get as much of the oxychloride off the bismuth metal, but then I kind of got lazy and picked up the metal with my fingers and started tapping it off with a stir rod. I then, using incredibly professional chopstick skills, transferred the bismuth metal to a beaker full of about 30% sulfuric acid, which I thought would dissolve the leftover oxychloride and clean the bismuth metal. This chopstick method proved to be too difficult, so I ended up just using my hands, honestly. Normally, if this was a dangerous compound or something that I didn't really intend to fully rub on my skin, I would have dug it out with a spatula and used that instead, but since bismuth oxychloride is relatively safe, in my opinion, and used in makeups and other stuff, I was perfectly fine with getting it on my fingers a little bit. After I moved all the bismuth metals into the sulfuric acid, I was left with a relatively pure and relatively fine bismuth oxychloride powder, which I then tried to transfer into a storage vial. I didn't really have a small enough funnel that wasn't entirely wet at this time, so I decided I would just fold up the paper and slide it in. I would say this is probably my second biggest mistake of this entire process, as I spilled the powder all over my hand at the lab table. Fortunately, like I said before, this wasn't entirely dangerous, and on top of that, my lab table was already very stained and not too pretty already. I intend to at some point paint it and maybe add an acrylic top so it doesn't get stained anymore, but I'm not sure when I'll be able to get around to doing that. After I somewhat successfully transferred the product to my storage vial, I searched throughout my house for some kind of brownish powder to mix with it to make powdered makeup. I finally decided on using some cinnamon powder, and with a little bit of difficulty, I transferred a little bit of the oxychloride and the cinnamon on top of a storage lid. I then completely failed at mixing the two powders together, so I decided to transfer them into a glass storage container and shake it up instead. At this point, my funnel was basically dry, and so I was finally able to easily transfer the powders. I then added more cinnamon powder and mixed it up thoroughly. Bismuth oxychloride has an extremely interesting structure as it consists of distinct layers of chlorine, bismuth, and oxygen ions. These are ordered chlorine, bismuth, oxygen, bismuth, chlorine, and so on. In the diagram on the screen, the green atoms are chlorine, the gray atoms are bismuth, and the red atoms are oxygen. This very layered structure gives bismuth oxychloride its lustrous physical appearance of the compound. This is the main reason that it is used in most makeups. Furthermore, it has a unique crystalline structure which consists of many small spikes along its crystals. These spikes can sometimes essentially poke the wearer, which can sometimes cause irritation. This also, however, keeps the compound mostly stuck to your skin, allowing for makeup using this main ingredient to stick very well to skin. At this point, I was pretty much done with the entire process, and I decided to take a bit of the powder and rub it on my finger. It clearly didn't match, but with the right ingredients, I probably could have made it way closer. It did smell like cinnamon, which was nice, and upon looking at it later, it had kind of a shiny and metallic look to it. All in all, I would consider this a relatively successful production, and although there were a few issues, I thought it was still really cool to have converted a chunk of metal into a makeup that I was actually rubbing on my skin.
In case you weren't already aware, I'm a pretty small channel currently, and I'm just starting with the whole YouTube thing. I thought I would take a little bit of time at the end of this video asking you to consider subscribing if you enjoyed this video. For the most part, on this channel, I will be making videos like this, exploring the science behind everyday products. Furthermore, because I'm just a student right now, I don't have access to a lot of materials and lab equipment. In order to make more in-depth videos and expand my arsenal, I'm relying purely on money that I've saved up throughout high school, but I would very vastly appreciate any donations made to me or my channel. Support from the community would immensely help me increase the quality of my videos, as well as the actual things I can do in them. I recently opened a Patreon account, and the link is in the description. If you would like to help out or donate in a different method, you can find both of my personal and official email down in the description as well. Thank you so very much for watching, and I hope you stick around for my upcoming videos.